Now we're really going to ramp things up. We get to experimental studies. We're actually going to intervene. Now I want to start off with an example straight off the bat. Murthy and colleagues, they looked at randomizing the administration of antimalarial vaccines. So they had an experimental group who actually received two antimalarial vaccines, and then they had a control group who did not receive uh, the vaccine. In actual fact, they received rabies vaccine. That was a very inter interesting trial. They really thought they didn't want people who volunteered for the study to go home, uh, so to stay empty-handed. They wanted them to benefit from the study as well. And uh, the rabies vaccine does not prevent malaria in any way, so that still formed a proper control group but uh, at least the patients benefited from being involved with this trial. Now, because humans were involved in this, we call it a clinical trial. So if humans are involved, we call an experimental study a clinical trial. So what happened here? There was an active intervention. Now, we can decide to omit an intervention that could also constitute, but most commonly we're going to actively intervene in some way and in another group, our control group, we won't, and we can compare those two. Now, this action, this intervention that we do, that really defines our experimental group. Now, we needn't just have one experimental group, as in this example. I might have a variety of drugs that I want to test, and I can form different groups, and each of those would, uh, would get that intervention. Very importantly, though, is this control group. Now, there's different ways to set them up. Now, in this instance, they got a totally different uh, vaccine, which didn't interfere with the study at all. We can give patients a sham intervention, and we've all heard of that. They get a placebo drug, or even placebo, uh, or sham surgery, I should say. Or you can just form a group of controls who just get the normal routine form of therapy. So there are many ways to set up your control group. The whole aim about a clinical trial, about an experimental study, is to reduce bias. I mentioned bias many times uh, in the negative column when we looked at observational studies, and we really want to reduce that to a minimum, and that's why we design experimental studies. Very important in an experimental study is this randomization process. So what does that entail? Well, in the ideal world, we'll have a list of the whole population under study, and we want to draw from that whole list at random, some individuals, so much so that each individual has exactly the same likelihood of being chosen. So we really have an importance here of having the whole list, the whole a list of the population, and obviously that's almost never, never the case. So there's always some bias involved here just to start off with. But what we want in the end is just assurance that there is some equal spread of possible patients that could enter a trial. So if we look at this example of ours of the antimalarial vaccine, they chose volunteers from an area, areas, villages near a river. So you can already ask yourself how unbiased was uh, this choice, this randomization? What about people who lived further away? Well, they are further away from the mosquitoes, but you've got to consider all these things when you read a trial and you read about their randomization process. Now, the next important topic I want to talk about is just the blinding. And that is, forms a very important part of, of a clinical trial. Now, we can blind the subject to the treatment, and that's actually uh, the norm, and, and, and really most cases should be done. So the volunteers or the participants in a, in a clinical trial should not know if they receive sham treatment, if they're part of the control group, or the actual experimental drug or procedure. Only after the study should this be revealed. Now, we can also blind the caregivers so that they don't know whether they're giving the sham treatment, whether this patient's part of the control group, or actually doing the intervention. Now, that's easily enough with a drug. We can make two tablets look exactly the same, but more difficult when it comes to surgery. You can't really blind the surgeon as to the procedure that he or she is performing. But we can at least blind the observer, the person who takes the data after uh, after the intervention. And if both the observer and the patient is blind, we call that a double-blinded study. And if it's well uh, randomized, it would be a randomized study. Now, let's talk just a little bit more about these control groups. As I said, you know, they can just be uh, the, a sham control, so they're going to have a sham procedure or take a placebo drug. Uh, 
but we can have other forms of controls as well. For instance, the self-controls. Now, what we would do under those circumstances is we would take some data on the patient. We would then intervene and take that same data after the intervention. So the same tests that we're going to perform both before and after. So that patient is really his or her own control. We can make that even more interesting by doing a crossover trial. So we're going to have two sets of patients, one lot with the placebo drug, one lot with the actual drug. They're each going to be their own controls, so we'll do some studies before and after that intervention. A period of time will go by and we'll actually swap them around. So those who got the, uh, received the placebo drug will now receive the actual drug and vice versa. And again, we'll compare them. So that's very interesting, a crossover trial where patients initially at least are their own controls. We can also look at external controls, for instance, historical uh, air controls. Very important if no treatment in a certain area existed before we did, the, we did this trial. We can also do totally uncontrolled trials where we're just looking at variations and outcomes and we'll form the groups based on those. So there's certainly many ways to set, up, uh, to set up the controls. What we're really after, what is um, the gold standard in clinical research today is the double-blind randomized control trial. That is really what we're after that gives us the most power, the most information, and the most trustworthy information in the questions that we have in, medi in medical uh, research and in the medical literature. Next up, we're going to touch on two very important topics, that of meta-analyses and the systematic review.